Okay, we start with this uh, rock physics session. We know that the very basis of all these quantitative interpretation techniques is based on rock physics. Rock physics is basically an integration science. It provides links between various types of data sets, like we have seismic data where we can derive attributes. Then we have petrophysical data where we have different type of petrophysical logs. So we can establish correlations between seismic related attributes and the petrophysical logs. And similarly, if we have core data and we have measured and correlated properties, maybe permeability, porosity, though porosity, we are also getting it from the logs. And similarly, like petronite reflectance, so we can develop correlations between various parameters, provided there is good degree of comparison between them. And then we can correlate things and establish correlations. And that gives us a good idea of interpreting rock properties. So basically, rock physics is everywhere, behind attributes, behind uh, ABO. Basically, in rock physics, we are dealing with these uh, fundamental properties related to the rock, the rock type, that is, what is its lithology, mineralogy, what are the fluids in it, what is the porosity. And naturally, we know that these properties change with depth as we move down and the depth increases, naturally, the temperature and pressure increases and these properties basically change. So it gives us tools to understand these properties as well as how these properties are going to change with the, the increase in our burden pressure. Initially, when rock physics was developed, just to give you an idea, because when we talk about petrophysics, so naturally petrophysics means physics of the rocks. So then what is rock physics? So usually we refer to petrophysics with the log-based, wireline log-based properties that are measured there, whereas rock physics usually deals more with elastic properties derived from various parameters, maybe the petrophysical parameters. With the improvements in technology, a lot of developments have been developed and it has become a mature science. And today, rock physics is considered as a genetic engineering of rocks. And we can go into very details, minute microscopic details of interpretations of the rocks. Basically, rock physics deals with three types of properties, the elastic properties, the geometric properties, and the fluid properties. By elastic properties, as we know, these are all those elastic moduli that like bulk modulus, shear modulus, poison ratio, and so on. And that is the beginning of rock physics because uh, from certain petrophysical information, certain type of logs, or even seismic derived properties like acoustic impedance, we can derive velocity and density and so on. We can compute these elastic properties. We would see what are the three essential components through which we can compute all these things. Then we have the geometric properties, which means what is the grain size or the pattern or arrangement of the grains, shape of the grains, their sorting, that is, they are uniformly or sorted or not, and then their compaction. So all these properties can also be inferred through rock physics. And also formation of the grains, like uh, whatever the sedimentary environment was. So based on that, these things can also be basically interpreted. And then finally, we know that rocks have fluids. So within the pores, what is the saturation of fluids? What is the specific gravity of the fluid? What is its viscosity, gas oil ratio? So things like that can also be interpreted from rock physics. But naturally, these interpretations require a very high degree of calibration of the data, and we need a number of controls. What are the three essential parameters? So basically, you can see here is a set of equations the very first equation is basically the Castagna's equation from which we can derive the shear wave velocity if it is not available from the P wave velocity. Then similarly, we have this Gardner's equation to which we can compute the density from the P wave velocity. So considering these two equations, if we have just the P wave velocity, we can compute the S wave velocity and we can also compute the density. And once we have these three things, we can compute all these elastic parameters. So this is an interneted link of different equations one after another we can compute all these things so the basic thing is the starting point is the seismic velocity if we have the velocity we can compute the shear velocity though it would be better to measure it and then we can compute the density and all these elastic parameters can be computed we would see what is the limitation if we have not measured these properties that is the shear wave velocity or density then what would be the limitations so it would be better to have all these three essential parameters with us 
we also know that velocity and density they are related to each other but if you look at this equation it appears that velocity or density are inversely proportional to each other but practically we have seen that as the velocity of any material increases you can see the density also increases but again why it is happening because in between the relations we have this k as the bulk modulus as well as the shear modulus and as you can see very little change in the density because density has a very small numerical range from 2 to 3 all the densities of different materials would be ranging so very small change in density accounts to a very much larger change in the bulk modulus and shear modulus since in the equations these terms are on the upper side and this is dividing it so it means naturally when this rho density is increasing the bulk modulus and shear modulus are increasing numerically with a much higher value and therefore value of velocity increases with the increase in density okay let's see the big picture we know that the rock has these three important components it has a lithology which means the mineralogy of that and that makes the rock and similarly it would have certain amount of porosity and within the pores we would have fluids so these three properties define the rock and because of these three properties we have the elastic properties of the rock which we also called as the rock physics properties or parameters which are again the bulk modulus shear modulus poison ratio and so on all these moduli and because of these moduli we get the velocity and density in the rocks and we know that if we multiply the velocity and density we get the caustic impedance and from that layer by layer we can compute the reflectivity series convolve with the bullet and we are getting a seismic signature or a seismic trace here i'm mentioning forward modeling because in the real earth if we have this rock it would have its elastic properties and because of these properties we would be having velocity and density and if we do the seismic or a source wavelet we ge generate waves we would get the seismic response because of that but here i'm mentioning forward modeling it means on the computer now there are algorithms if i define lithology porosity and fluid i would get the rock properties this would be called a first step of the forward modeling and then if I further forward model it, I would get the velocity and density, acoustic impedance, reflectivity series, convolve with the wavelet, and finally, I would get the seismic trace. So this is basically in the real earth happens, and on the computer, we can also simulate the same thing. And this is when we make a synthetic seismogram, this is also happening, and we would see in AVO analysis, we can also do the forward AVO modeling and we would generate seismic gathers in a similar way. Now, moving towards the reverse direction, if we have the seismic trace, we can move in the reverse direction and we can compute the caustic impedance. And from the caustic impedance, we can break it into velocity and density. And once we have these two components, we can further move backwards and we can compute the elastic parameters and further move back and we would get the lithology, porosity, and fluid. So this inverse modeling is basically called inversion. Usually we can talk about inversion and people say that we have done inversion. That is just the very first step that from seismic, we have moved to the caustic impedance. We don't have any practical use of the caustic impedance unless we move towards the rock properties because originally we are interested to reach here so basically that was the first step and we have to move further and ultimately hit certain rock properties it may be porosity its ductility or its uh, lithology or its fluids anything we can do so this is the complete picture like this this is what is happening in the real earth when we have the data then we can step by step move in the reverse direction okay let me tell you we are moving it here like in the reverse direction but practically we don't have any algorithms that allow us to practically move here what we are doing basically we can sometimes do forward modeling like in uh, seismic inversion usually what we are doing we are generating a synthetic model of the caustic impedance generating the seismic from it comparing it with the real seismic whatever is their errors we compensate those errors and in the next iteration we again update the caustic impedance model and generate the seismic response and get the error difference between the real seismic response and the synthetically generated seismic response and whatever is the errors based on that we again update the caustic impedance model in this way these iterations continue and we keep on updating the caustic impedance model until 
there is a minimum error difference between the synthetic seismic trace and the real trace. And in this way, finally, we infer that the caustic impedance model that we have generated is giving us a seismic response which is closely matching the real seismic response. So therefore, the real earth must be having a similar acoustic impedance. So basically, this is how inversion is being performed. So usually, as I mentioned, in rock physics modeling, we can have fluid substitutions that we just define a rock, that it has saturations of the fluids, which are oil, gas, and water. And we also define the lithology. And from these things, the computer would model all these elastic parameters. And from these, we would get the seismic velocities. And then we can generate a synthetic seismic from that. I always used to say that seismic velocity is the basic parameter of seismic. It is basically the contrast for the seismic method. And all the signatures of the rocks are basically hidden within this single parameter. So it is the overall representative of the rock unit, which is the lithology, porosity, fluids, and everything. And we have to decode this information from the seismic. So like I mentioned, from seismic inversion and all these tools, we can extract the precise information to get the rock properties. But we have to be careful what would be the tools that we need to extract a specific information from the rock. So you can see here we have the rock layers. And from this interface, we are getting a seismic trace from that. But what is, when we do the inversion, we get the caustic impedance and we compare it with the petrophysical properties, we get the velocity information and we get the rock physics and attribute tools. And through that, we can interpret what is the lithology, porosity, fluid content, and so on. So basically, this is how this overall workflow deals with resolving the problems and interpreting the things in terms of quantitative interpretation. Here, I'm just giving you a model. We can see this is the landward side and this is the seaward side. And as we know, here we would be having a high energy level. When we move towards the seaward side, this would be have a medium energy level and this would have a low energy level. In the relatively high energy level, we would have coarse sand and pebbles. Here we would be having a medium sand to silt and finally we would have a clay level material here. So naturally, whatever is the sedimentary influx, we are getting it. The lithology wise, it is the same material, but the grain size is changing. So naturally, it would should have certain impact on the seismic signature that we would be recording. Basically, seismic would be able to detect this change. So now if we record seismic like this, so in a normal seismic section, we would just marking this interface with a black reflector like this. We're just having an amplitude. But now if we just generate this amplitude as a colored attribute so we would be seeing that there is a change in the color that is the amplitude is changing and why this amplitude is changing because it is telling us that how the things are gradually changing so basically from the seismic signature what it means that we can decode that information and there must be certain tools through which we can interpret this species change so this is how this whole game works. That is extracting all these parameters from the seismic data. And we know this amplitude of the seismic is basically because of the velocity contrast between the two layers. And why is we are having the velocity contrast? It is because certain rock properties are gradually changing. So we say that seismic velocity is the net resultant of the rock properties. It may be the elastic, geometric, or fluid. And we need to decode it into rocks physical properties. I usually refer it in terms of this prism, like Newton did it, that we have the white light. And from that white light, when we pass it through the prism, we get all those rainbow colors. So similarly, velocity is the composite signature of the information. And when we decode it, we can split it into different rock physics parameters, and then we can interpret different rock physics parameters would give information or would be helpful in validating different rock properties. As I said that we are moving in the reverse direction, we can have a 1D velocity inversion. For instance, we have the sonic log 
From that we get the velocity and from the velocity we can compute all these rock physics parameters. So we are moving in the reverse direction. So we can also say this is a 1D velocity inversion from velocity to the rock physics parameters. So here you can see a spreadsheet from the P wave velocity. We have computed all these different elastic moduli. So this would be variation of elastic parameters along the borehole. Similarly, you can see this is a velocity model, which is giving you a cross-sectional picture of velocity variation according to the structure. So basically in seismic, we have the velocity functions. From these functions, we make the velocity model. And now once we have this two-dimensional cross-sectional velocity model, again, we can have a 2D inversion and we can compute the density section, bulk modulus section, and any elastic parameter like Poisson's ratio and so on. So basically we can see these are also attributes computed through the rock physics equations. So this would be the cross-sectional view of any rock physics parameters. Similarly, we can also have a 2D inversion along a horizon. Suppose this is a velocity control along a horizon. This would be an interpreted horizon for any interface. And now, once we have this velocity, we can compute again the bulk modulus, Poisson ratio, and other moduli. So again, this would be a 2D velocity inversion along the horizon. If we have a velocity cube, so naturally, we can have a 3D velocity inversion and compute various elastic parameters. There is certain limitations. If the S wave is computed from the P wave, then all the parameters that we have computed, they would have a similar trend. So it would be much more difficult to interpret things. So that's why it is better to measure all these parameters separately. The limitation is that if we are computing the shear velocity and density from the P wave velocity, so it means everything is being controlled by a single parameter. So then it would be difficult to interpret things. Though we are generating the information from the P wave, it is better to have certain information rather than not having any information we can see that P wave velocity for certain rock types overlap. Thus the computed parameters would also overlap. Whereas in reality, if certain rock types have their P waves overlapping, their shear waves may not be overlapping. In this way, if everything is being computed from the P wave, then it would be difficult to interpret the resulting rock physics parameters into useful geologic information. The solution is to conduct three component 3C seismic surveys, which provide P as well as S wave velocities. In such surveys, at each picket, we have three geophones, one for P wave and the other two for the two S wave components. Such surveys would be useful because S wave velocity ranges of various rock units show a different trend as compared to the P wave velocity ranges. Thus, each rock physics parameter computed from measured P and S wave velocities would show a different trend. A combination of such rock physics parameters will help in more reliable geologic interpretation. Alternately, we can also use seismic inversion techniques which will also involve integration of petrophysical logs. 